Complicated equations prevail in some classrooms and at the district level. We break down K-12 budget issues in this week's Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. This group of House DFL education leaders announced plans to tour select school districts in the state. They will discuss impacts of delayed payments to schools passed by the legislature last session and another shift in the previous budget cycle. Our children deserve 21st century schools, everyone agrees with that, to prepare them for a 21st century economy. We know that having the best and brightest workers is our best path to economic prosperity in this state and to a strong and growing economy. We're here today to tell you that House Democrats are committed to supporting that future and working with our schools to enact proven reforms. And that's why we are going on the road. We're going to be in Anoka Hennepin School District on Thursday, uh, and then in Wilmer, Crookston, Northfield, and Grand Rapids uh, to engage school stakeholders, parents, uh, students, teachers, uh, school district officials uh, in uh, this process directly. With the shifts, with the underfunding of education, and with the lack of emphasis on bringing Minnesota's education system into the 21st century, we're ignoring the fact that we have a global economy. And Minnesota's strategic strength historically for its workers and for its businesses has been the strength of its education system and the strength of its workforce. And by not focusing on that and building on those strengths, we not only leave our children without the skills that they need to be competitive as employees when they graduate, but we also leave our businesses with a lack of the very workforce that they need to not only innovate, but expand and build new businesses here in Minnesota. The DFL lead on early childhood issues in the House, Representative Nora Slavic, joins me now to talk a little bit about early childhood and the upcoming tour to various school districts. Thank you for joining us today. Nice to be here. Well, let's begin with the DFL tour. What do you expect sure. to hear as you talk about the budget shift with various districts? Well, it's interesting. We've actually done one since session, and this is obviously since school started. So um, we'll be going around the state to various districts, starting with Oka Hennepin and out to Wilmer and different places. I mean, there's a variety of things. I mean, some districts are prepared to handle the school shift, some of the bigger districts have reserves and things that they can work with. Some of the smaller districts, it's gonna be a significant problem. They're having to borrow this money uh, and that, that creates you know the interest rate and more money to pay it back. And so I think we'll hear a variety of things. I think in, in terms of the race to the top application, very exciting, $50 million for early childhood from the federal government. A lot of this grant, um, when they're looking at states, we hear is gonna focus on these quality rating systems. Um, Minnesota, we didn't pass anything, you know, it was controversial in the legislature, uh, but we, we, uh, the governor came out for it and it's gonna continue because it is in statute. Uh, so I think we're gonna be competitive. Not sure if we're gonna get it because it's, it's hard to get that federal money and they, we think there's gonna be several really big grants. But we'll see. What would you use it? In your world, what would that money go to go towards if we were to access a significant amount of it? Well, right now it's been piloted, the quality rating system, so it's mostly in St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, Blue Earth County. Uh, those, are the, those are the main places, so we'd be able to expand it. So when people say, well, the quality rating system, you know, we're in rural Minnesota, we don't have it out here, we could then start to bring it out there if providers wanted to go through the the process and a lot of folks do because for parents they like having that that star rating system they like knowing I'm going to a four star child care or I'm going to a one star because you kind of know where people stand whether it's restaurants or you know hotels or child care and representative Slack, your your caucus agrees with that uh, with the quality rating system however yes. as you know and you mentioned it did not pass through the legislature right. the governor did issue an executive order to create it. Critics have blasted that move. So is it something that, in your opinion, should have been created with the legislature's assistance? Well, and actually there, were, there are, is a quality rating system in statute. So the, the issue was this whole, do you, how to take it statewide and then how to work in with the race to the top money. So I think that the governor did the right thing. He came out in support of it and said, this is something that we want to do. Um, it's, it's something that 
all other states in the nation are doing. So when you look at the Minnesota legislature, part of me thinks, uh, you know, there's this group of Tea Partiers kind of holding everything hostage, and that was one of them. And you think, come on, the, the entire country is moving towards the system and a way to figure out how what's quality child care versus what's not. Why shouldn't we do that? So I think we're in support of that. I think we're in support of what the governor did. And um, really, I, I think if you took the whole legislature, the majority of, of the legislature would support that, that it's a small group that does not. Okay, the governor also named the, the folks who are going to be on the Early Childhood Readiness Council. Right. What are your expectations for that council? Well, I, I actually sat on it before, and we put into law that legislators would sit on there. So some of these task forces, they don't, but we wanted to be on there. Um, our first thing is this Friday, we're having a teleconference about the Race to the Top application. Uh, so the council is involved in that and involved in uh, not not necessarily writing the grant, but making sure that it is meeting the needs for the state of Minnesota. So we'll be um, working on the approval process for the grant. Beyond that, we really need a long-term vision for, for early childhood in Minnesota. As you know, it's met some controversy. You know, I think all of us in the legislature believe that parents are the first and best teachers of little kids. Absolutely, they are. But is there a place for the state in that, a place to support parents that need to go to work, welfare to work, supporting them by hel helping them get quality childcare. Is there a place in helping get kids ready for kindergarten? So low income, um, high risk kids uh, that can't get to preschool, that can't get uh, to a place to learn their colors and their numbers and all those types of things. The state has a role in helping with that and, and frankly a limited role. We don't wanna fund you know, uh, all education for all kids under five. It's just helping them get ready for school. And is there funding to try to move forward with those goals? Well, yes, there is. I mean, I think the easiest thing to do would probably be to take the school formula down, because um, you know who really has the most to gain from kids getting a good early childhood experience are the schools. You know, you hear about all these troubles with test scores and how kids can't read. Well, if you can get kids, okay, get those basics in four or five years old, then your schools are gonna do a lot better. You're gonna actually save money for the school system. So Representative Slock, let's look ahead to next session, policy sessions. What are some of the policies that you hope to push, to push, to push through, excuse me, and what are some of the Republican proposals that you're anticipating? Well, it's gonna be interesting. You know, it's a short session, it's a bonding year, and it's a redistricting year, so there's a lot of um, reasons to think it's gonna be a very short session. Um, I think the Republicans will probably come back with their sort of Florida-type proposals, you know, vouchers, um, which have been proven not to work in places like Milwaukee. Um, they'll probably want, you know, um, a lot of the things, you know, that they do the um, anti-labor stuff, the collective bargaining, all of that will probably be back on the table. Um, I think what you will also see that will be different this year is though that the Dayton administration is going to have their agenda and that they're going to be um, strongly uh, proposing certain education items. So you're going to see a very clear contrast this year with the Republican legislature and the Democratic governor would like to see. And what about you specifically? Any policies you hope to move through? Well, you know, we've been working on some of this for a long time. I'll probably have something uh, in terms of QRS trying to, to make it more statewide and looking at the policy if there's anything left that needs to be done. You know, after the race to the top of the application, I suppose we'll know by, by next session. Um, I think that all day kindergarten is really the you know, one of the big initiatives, it's, it is expensive, I have to say that, but the way that a lot of places do it is if you, a lot of school districts already have all day kindergarten. So the funding really is just to fund the ones that don't um, and to target it and to target it to really high risk kids. Because again, we know if kids are in kindergarten all day, you know, sort of the, the two and a half hours in the morning versus five, six hours, it makes a big difference. And given the budget, again, it's not a budget year next year, how optimistic, realistic yeah, it's is? it's gonna be tough. I mean, that's what I think we're looking at tight budgets for a while here. Um, I think most of government, we're gonna be doing some downsizing. So what we would have to do with that kindergarten money is if there there is some money for, for the schools is to make it um, where the schools could have the choice of how to use it. You know, they do it for all day kindergarten, they could use it, you know, potentially for early ed, they could use it for remedial work, they could use it for at risk that type of thing, and that's what we understand is that the schools would prefer. So it might have to be, you know, along a choice with some other things. And do you think by approaching it with that, that the choice would be up to the districts that you might gain some more Republican support? Well, potentially. I mean, if they had some things that, that they wanted to see and that the 
that they could use. You know, an example would be the um, integration money. You know, that now they're looking to, at taking it from integration to sort of um, innovation. So they're changing the name a little bit, making it more flexible, right? That's so I think at least we've seen with that example, it definitely gained more support. Okay. All right, yeah. we're out of time, but Representative Slog, thanks so much for joining us Great today. Great to be here. Thank you. The halls are brimming with 2,100 Roseville High School students. Their focus is on the classroom. The focus of administrators is maintaining a level of excellence in the classroom. A challenging task in financially difficult times, but they are meeting that challenge, according to Superintendent Dr. John Tyne. We've been very fortunate in that our staff is turning over and we're a growing district. In the last four years, we've added over 700 students. And when you add 700 students, that's about 10% of our student population. It really makes a difference. It gives us an advantage that other districts don't have. So we're pretty lucky. One of the things that we've been aware of in our community is that families prioritize where they want to spend their money. Our families have always looked at education as not an option, but a necessity. And they've always invested in their students because they know that investment is going to be re repaid. Uh, our real estate prices have held steady. Uh, our enrollment is increasing. We think that's due to the investment that our families in the community, past and present, are making in their schools. In the past two state budget cycles, the legislature has authorized delayed budget payments to K-12 schools totaling more than $3 billion. Understanding the budget constraints at the state level led time to prepare accordingly. When looking at the budget, noticing that there was going to be a $6 million shortfall, uh, I knew that schools were going to be a part of it and we were going to have to have some cash flow one way or another. So in early February, uh, we decided to borrow some money and we were very fortunate we borrowed some money in advance of the announced shift. So we were lucky, we were well prepared for it. According to a recent Minnesota 2020 poll, 90% of the state school districts have asked voters for levies. In 2003, the average statewide levy was $491 per pupil. By 2012-13, the average inflation-adjusted levy is projected to be roughly $1,100. 93% of superintendents surveyed said the current K-12 public education funding model is not good for schools. This is a result Tyne agrees with. I can look down the road and say this has to be fixed. Superintendents that are new to a community or new to a district and that are facing a referendum or are in a community that hasn't been always as supportive, this is really going to be a very, very tough, tough road to hold for them. We caught up with Republican Senator Dave Thompson earlier to get his views on early childhood education. Here to discuss a little bit about the early childhood education quality rating system and a more broad policy discussion on K-12 education, we have Senator Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with the governor's decision on August 10th to, to actually opt into that early childhood education quality rating system. It's a program that was not funded by the legislature last session and it is necessary for the next round of Race to the Stop applications. So it's fair to say it was one of the more divisive ideological battles of the session. Why are you not in favor of it? Well, first off, just procedurally, the governor shouldn't be adopting programs that the legislature heard but chose not to fund. To me, that's, that's wrong, and, and constitutionally, that shouldn't be done. But secondly, I'm not a big believer in the expansion of early childhood education because I believe that education up to age five should be the responsibility of parents, and uh, we should not turn our children loose in the in the education system, whether public or, or private, paid for by the state, until uh, that child reaches age of kindergarten. And I don't know why we continue to hand more and more responsibility to the government rather than having parents do their jobs, teach kids to count, to say their ABCs, to know their colors, those kinds of things. Supporters of it, though, do say that it's revenue neutral, so why not just move forward with it? Well, there's, a, there's a, a, a financial component to it, but there's also a policy component to it. And let's assume for purposes of argument, it is revenue neutral. However, how many times are we told that about programs and they end up not being revenue neutral? But let's even assume for purposes of argument that it isn't, that it is revenue neutral. That's not the large question. The larger question is who should be responsible for the education of babies to five-year-olds? And my answer is parents. All right, let's talk a little bit about a large question. Also, one of the large questions that you tend to pose is how active should federal government be in K-12 education and establishing policy? 
Recently, the governor has asked for a waiver to opt out of no, uh, the federal No Child Left Behind Act, stating that it's another, you have stated, it's another illustration of the ineffectiveness of big government solutions to problems that are best handled by individuals or local governments. It's fair to say that you don't agree with the governor on many policy issues. This is one that you do, but why do you think scrapping it is the best option for Minnesota? Well, first off, I find it ironic that at the same time the governor is acknowledging the failure of many components of No Child Left Behind, he's working hard to get us further into a different federal program. So I would point out that that's a little bit silly. Um, the reason I oppose federal education is because I don't believe that a member of the Congress from uh, Alabama knows anything about what it takes to educate a child in War Road. I don't believe that somebody who was raised in the Bronx, New York, or serves there knows anything about what it takes to, to uh, educate a child in Wyoming. So I believe education is best left at the lowest possible level of government. And yes, I'll say it, I would abolish the Department of Education and I would turn it all back to the states and local governments because I believe that that's where uh, things are best done. And, and I have, look, philosophically I believe that and the track record of the federal government is terrible. They've come out with these programs and even a democratic governor who basically believes in big government is acknowledging the failure. So let's talk a little bit about things that have been done. As a member of the Senate K-12 Education Committee, you've had a hand in some of the reforms that did pass. What are you most proud of? Well, I mean, obviously we would like to have done more, but I think I'm happiest about a couple of the, the provisions that got into the education bill that do things like uh, hopefully drive the cost down and make life easier for local districts. They're again coming back to my uh, philosophy that, that things are best handled locally. The state should not be punishing school boards and ultimately the taxpayer for not meeting contract deadlines. We got the January 15th penalty against districts uh, repealed. Also the maintenance of effort that required school districts to keep the same level of psychological and medical professionals regardless of what was going on population wise or school wise or revenue wise in the districts. We've got rid of that. That's a good thing. Um, I'm glad for the alternative teacher licensure. I think that was something good as well. So we made some progress in the right direction, but there's a long way to go. And let's talk about some of the direction to go next session. You were on the program earlier last session talking about your bill that would essentially freeze all school district salaries for two years. It didn't pass. Is that something you're going to pursue next session? Oh, not certainly not in, in January. We don't have a budgeting year. Uh, as far as 2013, who knows what the landscape will look like then. But I'll say again now what I said then. And that is that I would prefer that that type of legislation not be necessary. I would like to get a system where local unions, if there are uh, public unions, are dealing with local boards and that there's not this huge state presence and strength of a union that really kind of uh, puts the boot on the neck of school boards so that they'd have control of their own budget so that I don't have to deal with it. Uh, just like I don't believe that going to Washington makes you smarter, I don't believe that when I got an election certificate to send me to St. Paul that that made me smarter. I still think the people in Roseau and Brainerd and Duluth and Rochester know better what their kids need than I do. Just like I would like to think I know better in Farmington and Lakeville and down the area where I live than somebody who, say for example, serves from Minneapolis. So I would tend to drive all of this stuff down to the, the local level and let the parents be in charge of their kids' education. So how would you do that and what kind of policy would you try to focus on next session? Well, I'm a big believer in, for example, right to work. Um, and, and you might say, well, wait a minute, that, that's not specifically directed to education. No, it isn't. But what it would do is it would allow um, it would allow school districts as well as other employers, private and public, to deal with non-union employees, to work for them if they wanted to. And it would, it would take a little bit of the power away from the union to drive the agenda in the schools, which they do right now. So that's one thing that I would support is, uh, is that. Also, I would take a lot of laws off the books uh, at the state level that dictate the way local school districts do things. Okay, Senator, we're almost out of time. I do want to ask you a real quick question before we run out of time. We're going to speak with MMB Commissioner James Showalter in just a moment. Minnesota's credit rating, as you know, was just reduced, and a portion of that was uh, attributed to one-time fixes to balance the budget, which includes the K-12 budget shift. How would you value Minnesota's credit rating? Well, I, you know, I, I do think that it, it's legitimate for a, a downgrade. Look, I, I don't have technical expertise in that area, but the fact of the matter is, and I didn't like it, but to some extent, we didn't deal with today's budget problem the way that we should have. We annuitized the roughly $700 million in tobacco funds. We uh, increased the education shift another $700 million. I would have preferred to see all spending, one-time spending, structural spending, stay lower, 
pay our bills today with today's money and we wouldn't be confronting those kinds of things. And it's kind of interesting that 10 years ago and eight years ago and six years ago, I was sitting on the radio preaching this stuff and I was regarded as being an outside of the, of the norm extremist. And now all of the things that I was concerned about are happening. Our federal government credit rating has been downgraded. Our state's financial viability has been called into question. We've got unsustainable levels of government spending at, in Washington, in Minnesota, and I'm sitting there saying, I was saying this stuff five and six and eight years ago, and all of a sudden it doesn't look so extreme anymore. Okay, Senator Thompson, we're out of time, unfortunately. We hope to get you back on when session begins, though. Thank you so much Anytime. for joining us. Anytime. Thank you. We've detailed the impacts of the budget shift to one school district in this week's program. Education funding is a complicated formula in and of itself. John Brune explains. Minnesota has a long history of commitment to education. The state constitution serves as the guiding force of each elected legislature, past and present, to fund an ever-changing system. Education funding is a complicated mix of federal, state, and local government dollars, often based on various formulas targeting the social, economic, and geographic backgrounds of students. This video is designed to provide a very basic overview of how education is funded in Minnesota and the role that each area of government plays in the distribution of tax dollars to school districts. Education funding in Minnesota comes from three sources, federal, state, and local government. The federal government portion makes up the smallest amount of the education pie, about 9% for fiscal year 2012-2013. Typically, a block of money is sent to the state from Washington to be used for specific purposes. In most cases, the federal dollars get passed directly through the, the State Department of Education directly to school districts to pay for things like special education, um, community services, uh, aid to school districts, operational costs of school districts for kids that, are, uh, that come from impoverished environments. Those are pretty typical federal expenditures. The state government portion of the education pie makes up the largest slice, about 68%. Those are the dollars that we appropriate as they, they are dollars that are the result of general taxation in the state of Minnesota. And that, those are the main dollars that fund the, the school system. Education is unique in that most of the dollars that we spend at the state level is funded directly out of the general fund. Education is the largest portion, largest single portion of the general fund. It's about 40% of overall general fund expenditures. The so most of what uh, funds our state school system comes from general taxation, the sales tax, the income tax, all of those resources flow directly into the state school system. As well as being the biggest, state government funding is also the most complex piece of the pie. Money is distributed from the state general fund to school districts based on numerous education formulas, which are designed to create a more equal or fair way of funding education. At its basic core, a formula is a mathematical calculation without bias of generating dollars for school districts and charter schools and all schools throughout the state. So in other words, let's count the kids and multiply them times a number that we have agreed in law is how much we should give for each kid. And that's a way of allocating dollars without bias. If you didn't have formulas, you would have, then, then the, the education system would run the risk of being prone to uh, favor among legislators. Who happens to be in power today? Who happens to be in power tomorrow? And let's bias the money in one place versus the other. A formula has a way of creating a little bit of distance between the decision maker and where the dollars ultimately go. Uh, a number of legislators have talked about the notion of let's just take all the money that we have allocated to education and count all the kids and divide up the money. 
that's one view of what we talk a lot about in education, which is fairness. Fairness being every kid gets the same amount of dollars. But other legislators, and there's always competing interests in the legislative environment, will turn around and say, wait a second, every kid doesn't cost the same as another kid. Poverty is a factor. The ability to speak English is a factor. The distance matters. In, in, a, in some school districts in northern Minnesota, the distances are great and there are high costs for what we consider to be sparse school districts. All of these factors and many others tend to dictate why we need to have a variety of different formulas to deal with these differing costs. And these different formulas will reward some districts more than others. So because of these different uh, views of fairness and the state constitution that requires us to have a, a fair system for every child in the state, we have different formulas to deal with those effects. Local government funding makes up about 23% of the education pie. It consists of local levies or property taxes. The second largest pot is the local levy. And the state does have a say in those. Ultimately, the, the school boards of each district has to approve the local levies. But in some cases, we have formulas that are a blend of both state aid and local levy. The state aid portion is directly decided by the legislature in St. Paul. The, the local levies, um, the legislature does approve local levy authority, but ultimately it's the, it's the local school district that has to make a decision about whether to impose taxes on uh, the property in the district. Not all school districts have the same resources. So in some cases, local funding is enhanced with additional state dollars. One district may require more state assistance while another may need none at all. Understanding the scope of education funding is difficult to do all at once, so remember to begin with the basics. Funding comes from federal, state, and local governments. The federal government sends money to the state in one block or lump sum payment. It's then distributed directly to school districts for any number of specific purposes. Federal funds make up the smallest portion of education funding. State government is where the bulk of funding for education comes from. It's comprised of income, sales, and other tax revenue from the state general fund and is dispersed to school districts through a number of complicated formulas. The formulas are based on social, economic, and geographic variables and are designed to produce a more uniform way of funding education. Local government includes property taxes, or levies, decided on by school districts and local communities. Sometimes additional state dollars are blended with local levies to help particular districts around the state. For a more detailed description of public education funding in Minnesota, go to these internet sites. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching this week's Capitol Report.